the density will be the one will be among all the possible densities the right density so the solution of your problem will be the one that minimizes this function no okay so so far so good now we have an additional problem is that it is impossible to write the functional e explicitly as a function of density if we could the problem would be solved completely once and for all. That would be the wonderful thing. So this is where we have to do approximations. But, you know, you di we didn't do approximations from the beginning. We actually tried to simplify the problem, kind of building a mathematical framework where we kept the approximation as late as possible through the process. Okay, so, so this, is, this is very different from classical, where classically you say, okay, fine, electrons are just billiards balls and that's it. That's, that's, that's an approximation people use, but that's a very crude approximation. In fact, it's an approximation where you don't have quantum mechanics. So here, it's an approximation that you still have quantum mechanics. In fact, you are separating the different quantum mechanical effects. So, uh, the idea of code and charm uh, was to say, okay, you know what, we are going to separate the total energy as a part that we know how to calculate. We know how to calculate, that would be the independent electron. electron. So we are going to recreate a, 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 a problem that has an equivalent uh, an equivalent problem which has the same solution for the density but with different interactions, okay? So we are going to create a new potential, if you will, to do that. And that new potential at the end of the day is going to come up, come from what's called the exchange correlation. So, so uh, the main parts, numerically at least, the main part will be the kinetic energy, which is going to be a function of the density. And, of course, the kinetic energy for independent particles is easy to calculate, right? It's just the Lap Laplacian, and the density is just a sum, it's just a integral over all the independent particles, which you can fa easily do. There will be the external potential, we usually call it external, which is the, the potential due to the ions. That one, actually, you can write very easily as a functional. This is right there, actually. This is as easy as it gets. This is a definition of a functional right here. In fact, that's a very specific functional we are going to talk about today. It's a, it's a local functional. So these are local is simply when you can write it this way, where you have the functional is just a function of the density and nothing else, not the derivative or anything. It's called a local functional. Okay? It's right here. Then you have the Hartree potential. So the Hartree potential is this integral between two densities. So think about it as the two densities being charges at two positions in space, and they interact in a Coulombic way. So it's a classical term. It's the same term that's used in Hartree-Fock. There is no quantum mechanical effect in there. It's just another way that people use is that it's a mean field approximation. But you need it because it's, the, it's a very large chunk of the total energy. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any fancy <laughs> uh, physics in it. It's just something you need. But the most interesting quantum mechanical physics is actually in this term, which is the red term, which is really the complicated term, where we put everything that we don't know. Now, what physicists have been doing since the 60s, and it has accelerated a lot since the 80s and 90s, is to try to understand how to calculate this. Okay, And people who have been involved in this are are usually theoreticians, and they are trying to find some constraints. So they find a constraint on that particular form, and they say, you know what, I'm going to build an approximation that fulfills those constraints. And then those constraints, so you, this is where, again, you have a, a separation between physicists and chemists. Chemists say, we actually have a very, very accurate, I, was, I thought that you left, but you actually moved closer. <laughs> okay, I was, I was a bit concerned. Uh, and, but they, again, this is not a judgment here. I'm just saying this is a different philosophy. Chemists say, you know what? I'm interested in the number. I really want the number because what I want to do at the end of the day is to create a drug, is to create a, 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 new, a new chemical that's going to be used for an industrial process. I don't care as much about having the physics right, even though I would love to, but what I really care about is the numbers. I want to say that the yield of this reaction is going to be the one I calculate. Do I have the right physics behind it? 
Maybe, but the point is that I have the right number. So there's a reason why uh, usually what, what chemists do, they come up with models for the exchange correlation energy or function of, of potential, and they fit that function. They fit it to very accurate data sets. So you see people talk about machine learning and things like that. It's not, not different. They've been doing that for decades. Okay? And so the idea is that, okay, they have standard database, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the names. These are standard database that are really kind of written in stone, like uh, with 15 digits accuracy and stuff like that. And they fit that, and they say, you know what? I'm fitting so many compounds, so long as I stay within the realm of those compounds, I should be good. And indeed, indeed. The predictability is very good. Then you have the other camp is physicists who say, you know what? I'm not a chemical engineer. I'm not creating a process. I'm interested in the physics. So strong correlation, superconductivity, um, you know, condo effect, all that, the charge density wave, all those fancy things. What matters there is to understand the process, not so much to get the number exactly right. So what they do, and this is one example of a person in the in the literature who does that, is uh, John Purdue from a, from a Temple University. And what he, what John John does is does he has a number of constraints. I can't remember how many it is. Is twenty one? I don't remember. These are mathematical constraints that you can prove to be true just on the math part. And what he says, he says, you know what? I'm going to build a model that will exactly fulfill those constraints. That will be sure. So we have the physics right. Am I getting, am I missing stuff? Yes, I'm going to miss stuff. But the stuff I'm not missing, I understand them. Okay? So you see, uh, you, you will have people uh, who will use a more chemistry approach more, or the more physics approach. At the end of the day, we hope to converge to the same result, right? Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's a different goal, if you will. But at the end of the day, the, those, that approximation is working pretty well. Okay, so I showed you this already. Uh, the reason why LDA works so well is because LDA, which is just the exchange correlation functional for uh, uniform electron gas, which is kind of a crude approximation, you will agree, the thing is, why it works so well, and this is very interesting, is that it is the solution for an actual problem. It is the solution for, for uniform gas, right? Therefore, it, it does fulfill all the constraints, since it's an solu exact solution. So, and this is what, that's what people have in mind. They say, well, you know what? If you use something even crude but that fulfills all the constraints, I'm doing pretty well. So what about something that's not so crude that also fulfills the constraint? That's, what, that's kind of the, of the school of like John Perdue and, and others. Okay? And uh, this is where people move on from there. So they have the LDA, then they have the, you add the gradient of the density here. And actually, mathematically speaking, when you have a functional that only depends on the function itself, like this, we are going to call it local. When it also depends on the gradient, we are call it, call it semi-local. When it depends on higher order effect, we call it non-local. So we have non-local, actually this one is semi-local as well, it's also GGA, it, it depends on higher order, we are call it non-local. We know, it has been proven mathematically, that the correct exchange correlation function is non-local. So it depends on not just the density, but also the derivative, the second derivative, and so on and so forth. That's why it's so complicated. If any of you here in this room can come up with the right functional expression, you are actually going to be the most cited person in condensed matter physics and, 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 and chemistry and materials and chemical engineering. So if you have the formula, don't share it just yet. Just use it for many systems, create a company, create drugs and stuff, and then maybe it's published. <laughs> OK? <laughs> because this is, we are talking about predictability. Uh, but of course, you are scientists. You don't, you're not there for the money, right? OK. So uh, I could give you a full course on the different functionals that exist. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to just go over a couple here. Because I like to spend a bit of time on functionals themselves. I prepare some slides. So remember I told you LDA works pretty well. Well, turns out the GGA works actually better. Uh, for example, to predict the lattice constant or the cohesive energy. 
So you know the GGA lo looks better. So people are using, of course, as always, there's a lot of jargon. Most people are being kind of scared by jargon. I hate jargon, but you know what? I use it just like everybody else. So when you talk about LDA, this is very simple, local density approximation. What's wrong? What's difficult about this? PW91, actually, this is Purdue, the one I already mentioned to you, Wang. 1991, okay. Another one that's very well known is PBE. PBE is also Purdue, Burke, and uh, Eisenhoff. These are the three authors. You know, we kind of know those guys because just we read papers from them. So those names are always there. Uh, in chemistry, they would use, usually there is a B there. This is a B3 lip. It's Becky, that just does, uh, and is very well known as well. He's the one who does those hybrid functions. So you know, you end up knowing this is kind of, it's called culture, right? You know those names. Uh, you have that in every field, of course. And so you see people look at this and they say, well, great, it works better. Um, there is no such thing as a GGA flavor. So I told you Purdue wine, 90, there is also an 86, there's those, all those guys. So the B3 lip is actually, lip is those three guys. Purdue Wang, I already mentioned that to you. Becky is the well-known. Each time you see, you see a B, it's just going to be Becky. Um, so you see plenty of them. In physics, we like PBE because it has been tested many, many, many times, and PBE is usually your go-to functional. It's not one that's too expensive to use, and people use that. It's from 1996. Um, okay, and then of course there was a revised stuff. <laughs> because people revise stuff and so on, but they, they, they is a, there is always a way to improve these things. Okay, so the problem is that LDA and GGA are great, but they are not wonderful. Uh, band gaps, so electronic band gaps are still overestimated. Van der Waals description, I already spent quite a bit of time yesterday talking about that, uh, is poor in both cases. You have the impression LDA does great, but for the totally wrong reason, and, G, and PBE, for example, um, doesn't bind, does not have a binding from the walls. So do not do biological materials with PBE without corrections. You're going to be surprised that your DNA is not what you expect to be because everything that has that's uh, van der Waals interaction is missing. Okay. One thing I like to mention to you because these are very popular, especially in chemistry, is a hybrid functional. So a hybrid functional is a functional that's no longer DFT. It's actually using some uh, result from heart refog. Let me explain to you why. If you guys followed a little bit, or if you're a little bit in this field, I understand you're not all solid state physicists here. I get that, but I'll try to give you an idea from fundamental physics. Uh, one thing that we know is that there is this exchange, it's the Pauli principle, that tells you that two electrons cannot live in the same state at the same time, at the same place, right? It, that we, we know that. So the wave function has to be anti-symmetric. We know that. Imposing an anti-symmetric properties of a wave function on the, on the density is extremely complicated. Why? Because you reduce all the coordinates. We no longer have the coordinates of each individual electrons. So it's very difficult to enforce that anti-symmetricity after the fact on the density. It's very complicated, even I would say impossible, okay? So our heart rate fog does get exchanged exactly right, in fact, within the single electron approximation, yes. By building the Slater determinant, you make sure that your wave function is anti-symmetric, so the exchange is treated correctly, okay? So what people have been doing because of the difficulty of using exchange in density functional theory, they have decided to calculate the exact exchange as if it was hartree fock I'm not going to tell you how it's done. Uh, I could explain that to you offline if you want. It's not that the, the problem is not that. The problem is people now use GGA, a piece of GGA and a piece of exact exchange. And the exact exchange, you can calculate it because of the Slater determinant, the anti-symmetric wave function. And now, this is where people are very like, ah, this is, a, this is a sin, is that you are using alpha here, which is the alchemist number. So it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah, this is the price to pay. You have a parameter. So the first principle or ab initio approach, which, we, which says that we only use constant of nature, well, you kind of break that. You need to have a little bit of mixed of this and mixed of that. Again, 
if you follow, if you impose some rules I mentioned to you, the constraints, or a fitting, a fitting data database, you can say that you remain kind of first principle because that number is chosen such that you remain uh, faithful to the principle of quantum mechanics. We are, you know, we are getting on dangerous territory here because we're kind of justifying why using the parameters. But at least you can stay on, on good footing theoretically. This is very popular. Physicists, uh, chemists love b 3 lip In fact, if you want to write a paper in a quantum chemistry journal or a journal where you look at molecules, b 3 lip will definitely be your choice number one if you want to use DFT. I'm not saying it's the best, but it gives ext extremely good structures extremely good properties, energies, and stuff. Physicists would usually use PBE0, which is PBE with ex exact exchange, right? So it's always on top of GGA. There is also more uh, newer ones, which is like HSC. HSC um, does extremely well, but is also extremely fast. So they have ways to do computationally this much faster for HSC. So this is one of the reasons HSC06, for instance, is very popular. So you see here, I could spend time giving you acronyms and telling you this and that. This comes with experience. Uh, people discuss these things, but what's important is if you, if you ever do a DFT calculations yourself, you should be aware of one thing, is that the exchange correlation, the choice of exchange correlation function is key. Do not just click a box because it gives you something that's right, okay? Don't do that. Just be cognizant of the fact that this is actually a choice where you have to use the fact that you spent eight plus years at, in the college to get your degree. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It sounds a bit weird, but this is where you actually show that, that you actually that person in the room, okay? All right, good. Uh, by the way, uh, if you use, uh, I'm not even going to tell you all the acronyms. The point is that all the LDA results, you remember this, this graph, experimental versus theoretical, should be on the bisector if it was perfect match, right? These are LDA, underestimated. This is PBE, a little bit better. This is the round stuff. And then there is the uh, HSE, which is the hybrid functional with exact exchange, almost perfect match. So you see, these are the kind of graph that you want to look at when you want to decide which functional to use. TPSS, by the way, is a meta GGA. It's one way we use, it's a different approach yet. It's using the kinetic energy as well. Let's not worry about it. But it, at this point, since we don't know the functional, we can basically do whatever we want so long as it works. OK? All right. Uh, now, we can go beyond DFT because DFT remains pretty much a mean field approach for the most part. So we can look at strong correlation. Uh, Sorry, the picture is terrible here. Strong correlation will be something you find, for example, in superconduct uh, superconductivity. So uh, strong correlation corresponds to system we have a strongly localized electronic density, which DFT doesn't do so well with. I mean, you remember LDA was built for uniform electron gas. Uh, in that case, you would use something that's called LDA plus U, which is essentially adding an on-site interaction. Uh, people doing lattice theory, lattice gauge theory, there is Herbert model. I mean, people are using Herbert model. This is the same idea. This is this strong correlation that you add on site. So you can do that. Um, yeah, let's move on. And then there is another one, it's called GW. We say GW would be actually perturbation theory done on top of DFT. In that case, you calculate the uh, GW, G is a green function, W is a screen potential. Okay, so you have a, it's, it's V but screened, it's epsilon V, if you will, epsilon being the dielectric uh, tensor. And in that case, you can actually take into account the excited state. So GW calculation would be your, your choice if you are really interested in predicting band gap accurately without adding too much uh, parameters. So this is an example here again, uh, where we like to show the band gaps theory versus experiment, and you see that uh, the GW calculations are essentially perfect, I would say. So very useful if you want to uh, work in a semiconductor industry and you want to create a new, a new chip or a new, a new material for, for a channel, uh, that's, that's where GW will come. So GW, I'm sure, I mean, many of you uh, are doing, how many of you are doing lattice gauge theory or high energy physics or things like that? So for those guys, 
the GW, GW is one of the first, uh, and for the others too, by the way, <laughs> but it's one of the first fine mind diagram in the interaction, electron-electron interaction. So this is where you have those wiggly lines and so forth. It's a dressed Green's function. So this is where you would have, it's, it's, it's due to, uh, actually one of the person who, who made a very important contribution to this is a professor here at RPI, Professor Zhang. He, uh, he did a lot of calculation on this back in the 80s, and not just calculation, but theory, how to, how to, how to do it. Okay, uh, one more thing I'd like to talk to you. So, you, you know, I know it looks like a laundry list. I'd just gi like to give you a very brief, but hopefully accurate uh, description of, of where we are with DFT. Uh, many of you will never do a DFT probably in their life, so I don't want to go too much detail, but I would be happy to give you many more details if you want. I was telling you about Van der Waals a few minutes ago. This is another thing I'd like you to take home. Um, Van der Waals, it turns out, is a totally non-local effect. Mathematically, what it means is that you can't use the density directly or the f derivative of density in your functional alone. You need higher order derivatives. So it's a very complicated thing. And you probably understand why, if you remember, uh, Van der Waals interaction, uh, at least a London force, is re are related to, uh, to this uh, interaction between uh, instantaneous dipoles, bet between instantaneous dipoles. So those clearly cannot just uh, come from the density. They have to come from fluctuation densities. Uh, so it's, from that perspective, if you think about it, how the process works, you definitely, you can't definitely explain it from a local effect. It has to be a non-local effect. Yeah, it's a response, it's a response, an induced response from another density. So clearly, it's not a local effect from that perspective. I'm sorry I don't give you more mathematical proof of this, but I think the intuition is pretty clear here. The problem is Van der Waals is very important. Why is it important? Because many of the computational studies that we are doing try now to go beyond solid state physics, but also go to understanding life, understanding biological material, understanding drugs, uh, for example, protein folding, disease, how to understand why things happen in the, in the uh, in a human body or, or elsewhere. Uh, there is a lot of, you probably heard about the, the primary, secondary, and, and, and tertiary structure in biology. Well, it turns out the, the tertiary one depends mostly on Van der Waals interaction. It's just a configurational change, like, like for example, how DNA and the protein folding. Protein folding, there is no change in bond most of the time. It's really related to Van der Waals. So if you don't get Van der Waals correctly, so this dispersion f forces, you basically don't get anything right. And so what do you do at this case? Well, you use force field or classical physics, um, which is useful, you've seen example, and then you have more talks next week on that. But it's not very satisfactory because you have so many parameters. So what we would really like to do is to treat this quantum mechanically and be predictive. Okay, so how do we do that since neither LDA nor GGA can actually treat Van der Waals? Well, people were interested about this. I already said that to you, yeah. So this is an example here, for example, it's a, it, this, is a, this is DNA without Van der Waals, this is DNA with Van der Waals. It turns out what people have done is to correct the functionals. So again, two schools, uh, not necessarily physics, chemistry, kind of a mix. A, a mix. There was a school, uh, mostly people from, actually the people from uh, Rutgers and uh, Denmark, that use theory. They just came up with corrections, non-local functionals, okay? Others came with corrections to the forces. So you probably have heard, or if you have not, you should probably hear about uh, the Grimy approach, which is essentially adding a Leonard Jones kind of interaction, a 612 interaction. By doing that, you actually get the structure right. Now the price to pay is that you're adding some classical uh, parameters there. But if you have a good learning set, you get a pretty good Van der Waals interaction. So you get those long range forces. It's, I have lots of, of things here. I already told you that LDA, uh, that two things there, it's not, it's not correct. But what I wanted to tell you is that uh, you, do, you can actually show that some structure, some uh, functional that are supposed to be good. For example, let's have a look here for those two benzene molecules here. If you put two benzene molecules, they will actually have a pi stacking. There's nothing you can do about this. It's going to happen. There's a Van der Waals attraction between them. This is what people see in nature. Okay, there will be about 
eight angstrom away apart, right? That's that's a fact. Well, if you use B3Lib, which is supposed to be this hybrid functional, very good, com completely missing it. In fact, there is not even a minimum. Minimum is at infinity. In other words, in other words, they separate. B PBE, same thing. PBE is not going to uh, to include that attraction. So that's the simplest example you can think of. This here, and yet you get it wrong. Now, sometimes you can kind of get stuff that are okay uh, for for rare gases, for example. But this is pure luck. This is usually doesn't doesn't work so well. Okay, so how do you do that? You have to correct it. You have to correct things. And um, the correction I brought, uh, uh, this is a very hot field. Did, professor, did Dr. Sumter talk about that at all, Van der Waals interaction? Or you already forgot? Yeah. Yeah, lots of stuff. Huh? I know, I understand. It's so much information. It's almost like a, an overdose of information. And I, the reason why I try to really insist on the key points rather than adding just numbers. Pro, uh, Dr. Sumter actually was one of those developers of Van der Waals uh, functionals. He has written a number of papers comparing them as well. So, but he's very, he's very humble. So maybe he didn't, he didn't insist too much on that. But this is an example here, and this is a bleed, lots of spaghetti here, lots of stuff. I just want to show this to you. It's going to be my last slide on Van der Waals. I want to show you this to show you kind of a, of a spectrum of the different uh, corrections that people came up with. So uh, PBE is that guy, the purple one, no minimum, bad for you. Uh, Rev PBE, it was revised PBE, but it was not revised for Van der Waals, so there's no reason why you would improve Van, der Waals, improve Van der Waals, and in fact, you do not improve it. And then everything else is kind of attempt to improve. So the experimental one is the black curve, and all the others, the four examples here, uh, those four different examples, four di possible examples of corrections of Van der Waals. These are just four of them. There are many of them, but in a regular course, you will find them. Uh, so you see some of them do better. For example, DF2 does pretty well. Uh, DF, D, uh, DF, it's actually the pr first version, does okay, but the minimum is not the right place, but kind of does okay. Uh, and uh, you have uh, here, it's overbinding. This is uh, Chachenko. Uh, and S is Schrefer, I believe. Uh, Van der Waals, that one is a, is a classical one. Uh, usually does pretty well, actually. Not in this example, but usually does pretty well. And the other one is a D3. It's beyond that. I'm not going into detail. The point is, if you ever want to do a calculation, including Van der Waals in DFT, there are, possi there are solutions for you. But you are going to need to test a few possibilities. It's not, computationally, it's not a big cost, right? I mean, I, you do a lot of those calculations, Natalia. It's not a huge cost to add Van der Waals interaction. It's a bit slower, but it's okay. Yeah, it's a bit slower, but it's not like an order of magnitude slower or anything like that. It's maybe 10%, 15% slower. But the difference is that you're going to get, a, you get binding instead of not binding. This is a very important example. It's hydrogen molecule on copper. Why is it important? Well, each time you have a, a reaction that includes uh, water cracking, uh, water dissociation, you are going to have water, H2, uh, that's as a product. Is it going to stick to the, to the uh, catalytic surface, or is it going to go away? Well, it's kind of important to know, right? It changes the reaction completely. OK? So, I'm not going to show you examples because this is going to be a laundry list. Instead, by popular demand, right, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about functionals from a mathematical standpoint so that people who don't care about solid state physics get a little bit something about this. Um, so, how many of you are doing solid state physics here? <laughs> Just one, two? Three, or, 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 or you know, molecules or stuff like that. So after this talk, you, everybody's going to do this, right? Why? Uh, so just a question. I'm, so all of you are graduate students, right? Correct? No. no? no so those who are graduate students, is it who are, who are who of you are first year student, second year student, third? Fourth, fifth, sixth. Okay. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I said uh, prospective graduate students. 
soon to be pros uh, okay so those these are the ones I really should because those who have been for six years I think are you sure what are you doing what's your field yeah so it's a little bit late to move to to there is a <laughs> Actually, you know what? It's very interesting, but um, you never know what where you can end up with. Uh, the advantage of doing computational physics is that you can do so many different things just because you have the you know you have the mindset, and you have your mindset is to be well. You know, I've done, I've already so, always solved Lagrangian dynamic stuff all my life. I don't want to do no stinky quantum mechanics. <laughs> Well, you know what? It turns out that the methods that you've used usually can be transferable to many different fields. Uh, and so please be open-minded about this. Don't despair. Sometimes you, you're going to study something and you're going to use it in completely different field. Even better, what you're going to learn in one field, you're going to say end up working in a different field and say, I know how to solve this. And the people will look at you with big eyes and say, really? Where did you learn this? And it turns out from your field, the cross talk between the fields make it unique. So be, uh, yeah, it, it, this is the beauty, I think, of computational physics is that you are learning first and foremost techniques to solve problems. You are learning to formulate them mathematically first, of course, and then you solve them. I, by the way, that's the way it should be. You should try to formulate it mathematically first. Translate it on computers using algorithm things, and then you do the physics. So I, I, I always tell my students when I used to teach computational physics that computational physics is exactly like experimental physics. You're just, you're just running a, a computational experiment. Okay, so a good experimentalist can change uh, experiment. They are just good at it. They just know how to do things. They just know how not to break things. And probably if you're a computational physicist, you know how to break things. <laughs> so anyways, um, so um, you, you, can, you, you may very well end up even, uh, some of you might continue in academia, in, in academia, others might not. But everything you learn can be, can be translated in, in so many different fields that uh, you'd, be, you'd be surprised about this. So this is really, uh, this is really great. Uh, just one the point I wanted to say in respect to, to, as, to computational astronomy is that um, you know the early days of fullerene C60, right? You've heard about fullerene C60. It was, there was a Nobel Prize in chemistry for that. The motivation for this, so the one of the Nobel Prize winner, Harry Croto, who also passed away a few, a few years back, not many years, uh, he wa they wanted to understand the mass spectrum from coming from uh, asteroids. They did not understand why there was a peak at 60, exactly 60 carbon atoms. So of course the initial model was those long chains of carbon, just like you know polymers and, and long chains. And it turns out that it didn't work. There was it just seems like to be a closed cage. And it turns out that uh, starting from that, from understanding ast astronomical properties, if it was spectrum spectroscopy, uh, they came up with this, the C60, the, the furane. Uh, the soccer, the soccer ball uh, molecule, and this is what led to uh, to all the work in nanoscience in carbon, carbon nanotubes and graphene. Without this, it would probably it would have happened probably, but not the way it happened. So nanoscience was developed that way. So you, you know, just try to keep an open mind, and um, and you 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 see where you go from there. Okay, so do you want to do some functional derivatives for the, the remaining of this time, or do you want to take a nap? You want to take a nap? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I know it's 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 kind of cheesy, but I think it's funny. So, so um, functional derivatives. So remember that we have this wave function. The, the, we can write the wave function without this, of course. But remember that the Hamiltonian, can, we've, we've established, actually we have not, Hornberg and Cohn established that there is one-to-one -one correspondence between Hamiltonian and density, right? There's a reason why focusing on density was fine, because the system is completely described by Hamiltonian, but it's also completely described by density. Therefore, they want to one correspondence between the two. In other words, if you know the density, you know the Hamiltonian. Well, in principle. <laughs> Nobody knows how to do it, but we know it's principle. You can do it. So 
the wave function now, the many body wave function with every single details, is completely described by the Hamiltonian. Again, we don't know how to calculate it, but we know, but we know it is completely described by the Hamiltonian, it's the eigenstate. So in other words, you can also say that the wave function is a functional of the density, right? So this is another way to look at it. Uh, this, basically, this is a, a bit more, a little bit more abstract maybe, but the way, a many body wave function depends on the charge density in a very complicated way. And I said, if you know how to, to write it, uh, it would be, you would solve everything. By the way, I should tell you that all that theory, like many theory in physics, it's based on a starting equation, which is Schrodinger equation, you, you, which you can translate for other fields of physics as well. You know, the density being the main characteristic is probably true in classical physics as well for people doing other many body interaction. But let's go here. So a functional is a rule for going from a function to a number that we know. So this is an example of it. The number of electrons, or number of particles, if you don't like electrons, is the integral over the entire space of the density, right? That's kind of obvious, right? This is the charge density. If you integrate over the entire space, you get the number of electrons. So you could write that the number of electrons is a function of the density. Nobody does that, of course, because it's a number. It's a, it just it's a constant, so nobody does that. But in principle, you can do that. This is what physicists do, and it's the reason why we don't have any friends. But you can certainly do that. Well, that's the reason why we don't have friends. But um, okay, another example is the Hartree potential. Uh, the Hartree potential is just given by this. It should remind you a little bit of the Coulomb potential here. The ch this can be seen as a charge, dr d cube r prime, and r prime is a charge, right, at, around r prime. So you can look at that, the potential. This is another functional. So this functional here is a local functional. The previous one was a local functional. Remember what I told you about local function, and these are function, functional that you can work, can write exactly explicitly which, or with only a term that depends on the density itself. So these are local. This is just a name. You know, don't, there's nothing to learn, here, to, to understand. Well, it kind of, kind of it is. You, it kind of makes sense because you just have the density at that point. But a local functional is one that only depends on the density itself, of the function itself. OK. Now, let's try to find, look at the functional variation and derivatives. So if we have a function of one variable, for example, we have two types of variation of this. The first one is the one you know, is when x changes. And the other one is when f changes. This is the one that you never really bothered with because, well, why should you do that? You have given a function, you don't really care. So the usual one is that you have a fixed functional dependence fx and, then the, and you just calculate dx. You know that. You just take the limit. This is something you've done since primary school. I don't remember. I don't, I, don't, I don't remember, but uh, <laughs> we were all very pissed that we had to wait the second semester for integration. <laughs> and then there is a functional one where you actually change the function. I'm not going to read text. There is nothing worse than reading slides. I'm not going to do that. We are going to go right into the mathematics in a second. This is much easier to explain things. Okay, functional derivative already said that. So the functional derivative is simply coming from this. This is the variation of the function, basically at first order, if you will, right? Dropping everything else. You can understand this. You've seen that a million times, especially numerically if you do finite differences. I hope you are familiar with this. OK. Now, the functional derivative, it measures the change of a functional upon a change of the function. Uh, so this is where things are get a little bit complicated, right? And I'm going to use, uh, oh, we're already losing people. <laughs> I'm going to use an example, and I didn't rehearse this, but I'm going to do the, no, don't worry, I'm not going to, I, I like my cable. Okay. 
So my function, or my function, and we are going to do this, this afterwards, right? My function is the surface area enclosed by this string, right? My function is the surface area enclosed by this string. This is definitely a well-defined object. Now I can say this is still a well function. This is a surface area defined by this string. This as well. This as well. Anything. Well, actually, not this one. It's not so easy because it crosses. But let's say many of them, right? You 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 have to agree with this. I just did it. It's experimental physics, though, so you have to accept it. Now. You can say, hold on a second. How do you calculate the derivative of the surface, the, the functional derivative of your surface area when I change the shape of my string? The shape of my string is a function. The surface area is a function of my function. OK? Does that make sense to you? So the functional derivative is something that tells you how does my surface area changes when I make slight changes to my function. I actually didn't think about this before I, uh, this talk, but I think it's exactly this is exactly it. This is exactly it. Okay. There is another one. Another one is that what is the perimeter of this? You know, you can change it a little bit if it's a very rigid wire. Probably it's not going to change much at all. But you know, you see the idea. Okay. So this is what we by the, within the half an hour you know how to calculate this. Isn't that cool? I hope so. So this is exactly what we do. So this is a lot of stuff. I already did this it's twice the same slide. is useful. OK. This is the new definition you may never have seen unless you've done functional derivatives before. Same as here. The change in the function when I change my function. So you know when I was using my wire here and I made slight changes, that's my delta fx. There is a change in function, very counterintuitive idea unless you think about this stuff, right? This is going to be my function for my previous value of my function, of my string, plus a correction. Now here's the thing, and this is where I'm happy to have used this experimental apparatus here of high precision, is that clearly <laughs> the surface area is going to depend, so my function f, my new function f is going to depend on the changes everywhere, not just the changes at a given point. So clearly, you have to understand that when I look at the variations, I certainly need to integrate over the entire space. This is one dimension. Of course, we can use any dimension. This is one dimension. So clearly, when I want to see what's the change in my function when I change my, function, my, my other function, I certainly will need an integral over the entire space. Right? If I want to make a change in my surface area, I cert if I make changes, even if I only make a change here, just my fingers are here, clearly the surface, to get the new surface area, I'm going to have to integrate over the entire thing to do for the change, right? I mean, that sounds pretty clear. This is what this is doing. OK? So clearly, that change is going to be at first order. Remember, we have a second order terms that are there. At first order, I'm going, certainly going to have that, that delta f in here. And then I have this, num, this function sx. And I don't know what ssx is. Actually, this is what we call the functional derivative. The functional derivative in this is the function sx. This is all mathematical so far, but it's going to make sense. So just the same way as when you change a function, when you go away from a number by dx, the derivative is the prefactor, is the slope, right? The prefactor in front of your change. For functional derivative, the change in my functional is going to be the integral here. It's going to be the kernel of my integral for the over an entire space. If you understood this, you have understood what the functional derivative is. Again, it's first order, so it li your life is much easier. Second order, of course, a higher order is always harder. But first order, that's it. Do you need a minute to think about this? I'm going to give you a minute to think about it. Yeah, I sell those. 
functional kit, the functional derivative kit. It goes at 150. 150. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to, to. I'm going to have to to copyright. I need to have copyright. You can use a used one. Yeah. This is the only one that has ever been used for that purpose. Yeah, Mine. Yeah, yeah, so the parameter is constant. Oh, actually, it, it can stretch. Ask my ice market. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody is good with this. When I teach, I usually give a bit of time because when I was a student, I wish the professor sometimes gave me a minute to think because I'm not, I don't think as fast as others. Or maybe I, I'm not shy to say I do. Uh, so sometimes having a minute just to, just give me a second. You know, when you talk to somebody who talks too fast, say, can you please keep? Okay, same here. Okay. Oh, you see that? <laughs> oh, let's do it again. Okay. TFT. Yeah, no, 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 this is, this is, this is. <laughs> so, the notation, the one you use at Thanksgiving dinner just to look smart because you explained it was, it was eight years at college, is this one. It's beautiful, right? You have different deltas and stuff like that. This is the functional derivative. It's right there. OK? Let's do the things, right? Because, hey, we are physicists. We are not mathematicians. Let's take my example. This is the reason why I was thought about this, this perimeter, by the way. This is exactly what I told you about. These are the variations in my function. This is my string here. And when we, you actually deform it a little bit, you are changing the entire thing. So what is written there is what I already told you. I'll give you those slides, OK? So I don't want just to read the slides. So we are going to look at the changes now. We're going to do this. So this is exactly what I explained to you already by, uh, by explaining things. So the variation is a function at a position there. You can think of the change in the function as just being a, a Dirac delta uh, at a given point with a certain height, certain amplitude epsilon. So you can, you can think about it that way, right? You can think that the, the variation in the function is just a point-like variation at a given point, in this case y, and with a variation epsilon, you can do that. And of course, if you calculate the change in the function, the functional, this is going to be my new func my function for the new function minus the old function, right? Remember, here I have to do this because I have a function of a function. I can't just use a number, right? In, in a real, in, usually you would have used delta x or epsilon. Here we have to use epsilon times a function, which is the Dirac delta. Well, we can argue it's not a function, but we are not going to argue about that today. Uh, and then, of course, the, the change here clearly is going to be given by this. You see that? If you substitute this in here, you see directly that the two, the, the two definitions coincide, right? You see that? You don't have to look at me. You have to look at the, scre at the screen. Much more interesting. Uh, and of course, by definition, and then you see that, indeed, when you do that, you find that the variation is just given by this function here, OK? So just to give you an idea of what we, where we are going with this, when we, when we compare those two results, we find that indeed the functional derivative is simply given by the limit like we are used to, but instead of having a delta x here, we have an epsilon times a Dirac delta. So when you look at it from that perspective, functional derivative are nothing to be scared about. I, telling you, I am telling you that when you try to do it without having those introduction, it's very difficult to do a, f a functional derivative. As far as I am concerned, it's not that intuitive unless until you've gone through these motions. Do you want to do, so, so this is what you need to, will need to use. This is like the fundamental theorems of functional derivatives. Um, um, so this is how you would do it, okay? Right here. You want to do it yourself? No? It's OK, you're going to do it anyways. So um, yeah, this is what I already told you. Uh, well, I already, I'm not going to go through that. OK, 
So just to bring this back, this is very similar to the, f f the derivative that you're used to, which is right here. This is a functional here. Instead of working with numbers in the, in the spatial, in, the spa in space, in the real space, you actually work in the space of function, the function space. OK. Some more definition, and after that, I'll, uh, go, we are going to do some work. At least you are going to do some work because it looks like I've been doing all the work here so far, which is totally unfair. Uh, this is, if the function only depends on n, it's going to be a local function. No, if it depends on n prime, it's semi-local. I already told you all this, but teaching is repeating. And if you put everything else, it's not going to be non-local. So, and it doesn't matter if you do DFT or if you do anything, that's going to be important. Okay. First example. Um, local functional. Why don't you calculate the functional derivative of n, of the number of electrons? So I try to remind you. Do we, do we have some paper here? Oh, yeah, at the, at the back. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to get, I'll, I'll get it. Don't worry, guys. I'm not, I was not asking people to do the work for me. Thank you, though. Um, so, uh, can't we do this? Uh, doc cam. Yay. OK, so um, people who know me, that would be kind of over there, uh, know that I, my handwriting is horrible. So please. Uh, If it's blurry, it's good, right? OK. So let's say we have n is equal to what? Integral of the entire space of nr. That's it, right? Is that, is that clear? No. <laughs> I usually do this. I put a cross in the middle, and it doesn't work. OK. So and I say here. I say. But my finger is there. Should I move it? <laughs> like this? Yes. OK. So the question is, so obviously this is a local functional of the density. What is delta n over delta n? I'm asking you to do it. I'm not going to do it. Just apply the uh, apply. The, the, apply this. Does anyone want paper? Oh yeah, we have more paper here, right? I don't. I'm not going to need all this. Anybody needs paper? We have more paper here. This, it's not a trick question, by the way. The trick questions are, is, is coming later. Oh, you already have done it? No, but You're thinking about it. Think well, I'm just a camera. So you, you, you really don't, don't overthink it. Just apply the f definition we just established. Just do that. So basically what you need to do is that delta n over delta n is simply going to be given by the limit when epsilon goes to 0 of n of n plus epsilon delta r minus r prime, let's say, minus n, n of r, divided by epsilon. Yes? So you, you just use Taylor expansion of this. So this is going to be equal to n, n of r, plus blah, blah, blah. I let you do this. Pen pen? Why? 
Uh, you don't like my blue? No, the paper dries up. You can you can throw it. Thank you. You want this one instead? Sure. <laughs> you can't catch anything. <laughs> <laughs> Poor boy. He's like, oh. I came up this is not a baseball player. <laughs> so what's the answer? Intuitively, what's the answer? Hmm? What's the answer? What's the what's the, the what's the functional derivative of the number of electrons when I change my density? It should be one. This is what you found, one? Hmm? I'm just, I'm not, no, I'm asking you. Okay, Jeanette, you, I know you like to do this. Uh, by the way, he doesn't like it. Yeah, but explain what you're doing. Okay, so I just put in uh, no, leave it, leave it there, leave it there, leave it there. Let me let me put on the, on both screens. No, I don't know if you'll be able to zoom too much, but let me put them on both screens. Then maybe you'll see better. Is that better that way? You missed the integral of your part. Hmm? You missed the integral sign of your part. No, because he had the part. I had not written N explicitly yet. So I didn't do anything wrong yet. Basically, uh, Jonathan is just giving the next line to what I said, but there was an epsilon. Yeah, go down a little tiny bit so that we see the epsilon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's yeah, You're good. You're good. You're good. So th basically, this is coming right here. But the problem is that it's too low. Yeah. It's all your fault. I said so, right? Yeah, I know. What did you do there? Some you didn't <laughs> if you don't like coffee, you should not spit. <laughs> if you don't like coffee, you should not drink it. Okay, so does that make sense to you? So you see how I mean that it's not necessarily intuitive? <laughs> the answer is right, by the way. The functional derivative of the density of, of, of n is actually 1. There is a simple formula, it turns out, but I don't want to give it to you just yet, is that when you have a local functional, all you have to do is to calculate the derivative of the argument and the integral, which is 1. But So basically, this is all you need to do. Is everybody OK with this? It's much simpler than you might think. So let's try to see, to have more examples. And I'm going to switch back to, to uh, let's say, projector A. And I'm going to see, yeah, by the way, that's what we have. Now, semi-local. It turns out that for semi-local, the, 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 sol the solution is this. Uh, but we will see that in a second, and I'm going to do that. These are rules, I don't want to do that. Okay, now I want you to do this one. This one, by the way, is neither local nor, nor local, whatever. It's just a complicated function, N and R. So what is the functional derivative of the heart rate potential? Um, you are going to be surprised by the answer, by the way. This is the most important, the, the, this is very enlightening to do this. You're going to be surprised by the result. <laughs> okay, so you just do, is everybody with me here? All you have to do is to apply, uh, again, I actually am very nice, I put the same, you have to apply the, the equation on the top, 
remember though that you can drop every second order term so everything that's going to be epsilon square and so on can go away that's going to help you a great deal in this case because you have a multiplication of two n's so you're going to have epsilon square that is second order it goes to zero right so do it i like you to do it because there is something that's really surprising Well, it's surprising to me, maybe. Yeah. If, so, if anybody is completely stuck, just raise your hand. Uh, just discreetly if you want and then can come and try to unstuck you if you want how is it going here it's going thinking it's thinking is good for you Once I find the right answer, I send them to the to, to the camera. you guys doing here no that's the way to do it you now you have to do you have to do it right yes but th there is a there is something uh, let me tell you People get this wrong. Students get this wrong because they don't know how to do functional derivatives, and we never teach students to do functional derivatives, okay? And the, and the really big surprise, I'm going to give it to you anyways, is the one-half. So you find a one-half and say, come on, that must be a mistake. There is not one-half in Coulomb potential. No, there is no one-half in Coulomb potential. Just so you know, there is no one-half in Coulomb potential. <laughs> Where is this one-half coming from? Yes, but it's actually not even, it, it is, in fact, we call it double counting, but it turns out the Hartree potential does not have a one-half. Oh, by the way, did I, I hope you have heard that the derivative of, a, of, a, of a energy is a potential, right, with a minus sign, right? So that's what we are talking about. We go from energy to potential here, and this is going to be the derivative, and you will see that one-half is going to disappear. The one-half is there because of the functional derivative. But I want you to find this. I kind of give it away to you, but it's kind of obvious when you will do it. Because you're going to have a term without epsilon, two terms with epsilon, and a term with epsilon square. The term with epsilon square is going to go away, The term, and you have two terms with epsilon, so you have a factor of two. I'm kind of giving you the answer right away, right now. And the cameraman, he should also do it. <laughs> I'm being followed. <laughs> are you guys okay with this? Are you you are looking from the Wikipedia? No, no, I'm just looking for copies. Yeah, but it's uh, it, it's uh, it's surprising that why we don't learn to do functional derivative at school, right? Yeah. I'm I'm sure mathematicians do probably in one of those differential class equation class, but we don't actually learn this. So nobody dares finishing it because they know they're going to be sent to the... Oh, almost done. <laughs> Hiding the answer. Thinking. So you see the one half where it's coming from. It's coming from this. I personally, when I learned how to fork and stuff, I had no idea what the one half was coming. So people said double counting and stuff, but kind of, you know, you know, believe me, it's one half, right? It's for that reason. If you forget one half, by the way, you get it wrong completely. 
the science isn't correct. Almost. You said we could just forget terms. With you have to. You have to. You forget. You have to. Don't forget. You have to. You need one more. Uh, Okay, one step that's important, of course, is when you write explicitly all those stuff, you have to use Taylor expansion for the n, right? Because you're going to calculate n at r plus epsilon something, right? This is where you do Taylor. So you're going to have the function plus what's happening at epsilon. And when you multiply them, because it's n times n r prime, there will be an epsilon square. And that one you can drop. I mean, you should drop because, because of the epsilon goes to zero. And this is where you, you things will work out. You find it? Yes. <laughs> so does it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Why don't you go do it on the on the camera for us? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I can try. So I found this problem as my quiz number one when I taught DFT four years ago. And people, students didn't like me for that. I don't know why. Well, there are probably other reasons not to like me. But um, OK, so let me see. Um, doc camera, P, I'm going to put on both. You can, yeah, j y what you should do is just write it here. Okay. And, and people will see, will see what's happening. Like somebody just found the answer. Not really. Just <coughs> so. To see if trying to break over this one. No, no, but you see, um, yeah, that's not correct. So what you should have done is n plus epsilon something times n plus epsilon something. Mm -hmm. What you are changing is not r, is n. So you were, so what you were doing is the mistake I would have made too. And when you do that, you, the factor of two does not go away. So what's really important is to, uh, is, well, we don't have it there anymore, but it's n times n. It's n plus epsilon delta times n plus epsilon delta. And there you said n, n plus epsilon delta. And of course, that's all. So here, actually, if you are too smart, you can't do it. I'm sorry, I mean, with exceptions, right? Uh, because if you are smart, you are trying to jump ahead. No, just do it blindly. Just follow the definition. Don't worry about it. If you if you exactly plug in the numbers from the definition, it comes straight. It's straightforward. But if you think too hard, then it doesn't. <laughs> Students like to hear that sometimes. <laughs> Or you can just take care of the camera. Then you don't have to do it. <laughs> did, you, did you find it? You're still working on it? Yeah, but that's it. So, uh, not, co no, not quite. Not quite. Yeah. Just keep working. You, you have to stick the, the deltas. You have two yeah, this is, yeah, this is what I said. If you think too hard, you get this, which is not correct. But is, Paul is right. This is this is uh, this is not correct. Nope, nope. So you were, that shows that you are smart because it's the people what there's a mis You want me? To, I can do it. You want me to do it? I'm going oh, to. Tr I see, I see what happened. You see what happened? What happened? Yeah, is that? I, and, yeah, yeah. I should. I should. Uh, yeah, to start over. Start. Yeah, yeah, start over. Just here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. It's it's as I said. I've seen that mistake. Half the class is making that mistake for some reason. And just because you're not used to playing with function. So you, did you get it? Yeah, that's, that's correct. You, and it's not really not complicated, right? But somehow it's difficult. Some, somehow it's difficult. <laughs> I don't know why, but. We will have 15 minutes left. And after we do that, I'd like to go back to our surface area problem. I'm going to skip a few slides. I'd really like to. Yeah, yep. Don't forget, you have, don't forget epsilons in front of your delta functions. Otherwise, things will not work so well. You may want to change. 
change the variables you use in your analysis? Right now, when you take that integral, you'll get a divergence. Uh, use like y or something. As no, you can. You, yeah, you can use r. You have to, yeah, you have to use r minus r double prime. Yes, and the second one you have to do r prime minus double prime. Yeah. Yep. Yep, exactly. Because it has to be it has to be consistent. Now the problem is that where does the double prime come from, right? Because it makes no sense. It's it's not it should be a dummy variable. And that's one of the problems with functional derivatives. Is that sometimes people just put a dot instead of the of because you do the, the double prime is gonna disappear for some reason. In fact, it will just get back into the integral because of the delta. So when you like to keep all your ducks in a row, you want you know what's on the left is on the right unless it's being reduced by an integral, but not quite here. That's the price to pay from the fact that it's a non-local effect that you have to actually like integration over the entire space. Is it, is it working for you? Is it working for you? Looks good to me. It's what matters, right? No, what matters is what it, it looks good to you. What about Natalia? You did this already. You took the class with me four years ago. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't take the class. I thought you failed. <laughs> yeah, that's it because I didn't take it. <laughs> Actually, I checked my slides. I don't have 500 slides. I have 708. <laughs> 708. <laughs> I think you you're doing fine. So. So there, there are some locations in uh, I made a mistake. Uh, it looks fine so far. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, don't forget that you have divided by r minus r prime there. Yeah, and same here. And then the other term is epsilon squared, so it drops. No, no, this one is epsilon and then our prime prime. Yeah, the cross term is going to go away. OK, so for next, for those who are already done, you can already think about how you write What's the functional to get the surface area of any curve that's actually closed? <laughs> All right, listen. I think you have to go. Can you move up a little, move this up a little bit so that people can start to see what you're doing? Actually, that term does not go away, right? That term does not go away. No. No, but that's fine because these over the integral are going to be the same. So I can finish for you. Okay. Uh, you did 99% of the work. So basically, you have one. That term's one is the same as that term here, right? So these two terms are going to get away, go away. And then you end up with these two terms, which are the same, because even though they have different arguments, they are, we integrate over those arguments, so they are kind of dummy variable. So basically, what you end up with is epsilon 1 half integral of nr. Oh, yes. You had the delta missing r here, of course. Prime, yeah. r, prime. r minus r prime, right? But remember, the derivative, you need to divide by epsilon. Remember that? So that's my epsilon that I have left right here. So I divide by epsilon, and this is going to be my, deriv my functional derivative, which is called, uh, by the way, it should be not half, because you have two one half. So it's going to be a one. So that's called the Hartree potential. So what's, so, so that's, that's, busy, that's the answer. Now, th thank you. So now, the point is, you need a one half in the energy, but this one half disappears when you take the potential. It's obvious when you go through this motion, of course, why it's true. So you know this double counting thing is kind of a dangerous thing to say. 
even though that's how I was taught as well. Okay, all right. Okay, so it, it's not wrong. It's just it, there is a mathematical reason. This is the answer, and again, I give you all the. I'll give you the. I'll give you the slides. Okay, so this is the answer. Now, I, the reason why I'm actually rushing a little bit, we have 10 minutes to go. I at least want to give you the problem. If we don't have time to solve it, at least I want you to see it because I think it's a kind of, if you can solve that, you kind of know how to do functional derivatives. Uh, these are examples, if you want. I give you four examples, and I give you the solutions as well. It's going to be in the slides. I'm not going to do that now. But let's go back here. We have my, I have my curve right here. And it's generated by a function r of theta, right? It's, it's going to be periodic. That's what it is. And I want to know, uh, we are, I want to consider all those functions. So basically, that's, these are it. This is this, right? This is all my function I can do. And I want them to do, I want them to be periodic. How do I enforce periodicity? Well, I tie the two ends. This is periodicity for physicists. You tie the two ends, and it makes it periodic, of course. It means that the last point is the same as the first point. Okay, so, and it's a two-dimension curve. So we can define two types of functional. One is the perimeter of the curve, which is the length of the curve, and the surface area. I already mentioned all that, so I can go a little bit faster. And then, uh, basically, that means that we have a function of a function. Okay, so let's try to do it. Okay, surface area. Well, the surface area of a curve Suppose that I know my curve r of theta. So basically, this is the point on my curve as a function of theta. Of course, the surface area is simply going to be given by r d theta r. Why is that true? Well, the surface area here, my small triangle between theta and theta plus d theta, is simply the surface area of my triangle here. Last time I checked, the surface area of that triangle is simply the height times the basis divided by 2. The basis is almost the arc, the arc being given by r dr, d theta, this arc there. The height simply given by r d theta, d theta. Therefore, the surface area is r times r d theta divided by 2. r dr r divided by 2. And I integrate that over all my angles, and that gives me my surface area. Right? This is the way we do it. Everybody followed this? Yes? Surface area of a triangle? I think that's definitely primary school. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I know, but... Is that okay? You get, everybody's there, so the one half here is not double counting. It's because surface area is one half the height times the thing. All right, so this surface area maps a real function r of one argument theta over a number, which is my surface area. Now, one that's much more complicated is the perimeter, actually, believe it or not. <laughs> so I tried to do this picture, uh, and I'm <laughs> we are going to try to do this correctly, right? We could do it wrong, but then we would waste our time. So let's not do it that way. So suppose that I go from this point here to this point here, just separated by d theta. Of course, it's exaggerated for effect. Now, what I'm really interested in doing is to go from here to here. This is my length of my piece of the length of the, of the curve. Now, you could say, well, I can just use what I told you before, the arc, right? Which would be r d theta. That's, that's the length of the arc from this point to this point. But if I do this, I'm actually missing an important piece, because it turns out that the length, because by the time I get here, okay, I'm no longer on a circle. So I need a correction. And the correction is just this little flag, this dr that I have. Therefore, the perimeter is, look at this triangle here, which has a base dr and which has, uh, I guess, uh, um, which is here, a uh, length r d theta. And what I'm interested in is the hypotenuse, hypotenuse. Is that the way, the way you say it? Yes. So basically, the square of what I'm interested in is the square of this plus the square of this 
this being r d theta. So r squared d theta squared plus dr squared is d p delta p squared. This is my perimeter. Why didn't I correct for this when I look at the surface area? Because I would have seen a second order term in my my, my area, which I don't care about. I only keep the first order. Here I have second order because it's a square, so I have to do that. Okay? These are the lowest order, if you will. Everybody is good with this? I mean, this is kind of differential geometry that probably didn't do it in primary school, but you probably did that in, in college. Calculus one, maybe, two, three, four, five, well, if you've done it here in five seconds. So this is going to be my perimeter. So I have to integrate this. So it's a little bit more complicated into the surface area, but you can define, again, a perimeter uh, functional, which is right here, which is simply going to integrate the square root of this number over all the angles. So again, this is a bit more complicated, to be honest, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter at all. The point is that this is a functional of my position there, OK? So what's interesting here, and I like to bring it up because it's kind of interesting, I think. This is now a semi-local functional. Why? Because the function does not just depend on r, which is my function, but also depends on r prime. So this functional here this does not just depend on the, on the curve, but also on the derivative of the curve. Well, you can think about it geometrically why that is true. OK? Now, this is where things are really great. And we're going to finish with this. Is that suppose I want to maximize the surface area under my curve with the constraint that the perimeter stays the same. So in other words, I have my, cur my curve here that is not really, uh, that's not extendable. It's not a rubber band, it's really stiff. And I want to deform it. And what is the right curve that's going to maximize the surface area? I hope you know the answer. What's the answer? It's a circle, right? That's going to be the largest surface area. Well, you can do that mathematically. You create a new functional B, which is going to be the surface area with a Lagrangian multiplier. Lagrange multiplier. The Lagrange multiplier ensures that my perimeter is a constant. Yep. You've done this many times before. Probably not with functionals, but with functions for sure. Lagrange multiplier. So what we need to do, and this is where the functional derivative come into the game, you want to minimize this under the constraint of constant p. right? So you have to calculate the functional derivative of b. This is all linear, so the functional derivative of b is the functional derivative of a minus mu functional derivative of p. But you guys are expert in functional derivative now. Yeah? We know a, we know p's. So we are going to calculate them. And in fact, just to summarize, and again, I'll give you those slides, so I'm not expecting you to follow all this in 35 seconds, OK? You have A, you have P, that we just saw how to calculate. And we need to calculate the derivative of these two guys. The derivative of this is actually very easy. This is just R. The functional derivative of this is simply R. Functional derivative of the surface area inside the curve is just the function itself. Just think about this, why this is true. The functional derivative of p is much more complicated, but it's also doable, and it's going to be given by this. Okay. So basically, now I have this, and I need to make it equal to 0. It doesn't take much time to see that if you use r is equal to a constant, in other words, a circle, right? If r does not depend on the angle, that means it's a, it's, a, it's a circle. So if r is a constant, if r is a constant, all this stuff goes away. r cubed divided by r cubed, last time I checked, it was 1, right? Is that true or not? And then I get this, all this equal to 0. We're going to see that next one here. So if I use 
with the R equal mu as, a, as my Lagrange multiplier, we find that indeed, using all those complicated math, we find that indeed the optimal shape, if you take a string of length L, the optimal shape to have the largest surface area is a string, is a, is a circle. Now you can say, well, hold on a second, I want to minimize the surface area. Well, you already know the answer to that, right? So how do you minimize the surface area? You know the answer. How do you do it? Hmm? Yeah. Well, it has to be close, right? Yeah, close. So what's the answer to that, do you think? So the surface area will be zero in that case, right? So basically, the solution is r is equal to zero everywhere, right? And r equal to zero everywhere is also an extrema of that functional, but in case of being a maximum, is a minimum. So that's th those two cases between the two that you have. So you see, this is the power of functional derivatives. This is a simple example. It's actually not that simple. If you understand that example I just showed, and again, I went fast, so I'm not expecting you to, gra to have everything under control at this point. But if you do get this, it's going to maybe take, take you 15, 20 minutes if you have time to do it. You basically con understand functional derivatives and how to use them. So timing is perfect. I'm two minutes late. But timing is perfect anyways because I'm done. I really hope that you've learned something. That's my goal. I'm not expecting you to become an expert in DFT. I'm not expe expecting you to be an expert in functional derivatives. But I re really hope you've learned something. All right. Thank you. Also, there's no more. There's no talk after this. Oh. I thought there was another talk. I, I have a meeting. I have to go to at 3:15, so I won't be able to stay. Okay. In fact, I need to find my keys because I lost my keys. Oh, he's right there. <laughs>